the budget for the event and also Roberto Weiss. Uh, Roberto Weiss also for supporting the event. And of course, in a minute, in uh, brief minutes, I, I only have three pages to, for the introduction. We're going to hear uh, Nestor Diaz de Villega. And instead of presenting the book, what I thought it was better, since we don't know, most of us don't know about Cuba, I thought of maybe placing Nestor Diaz de Villega in the Cuban uh, literary tradition and explain, in a way, my reading of his work. So I'll try to be as clear as possible, and I'm sorry if, you're, if it gets a little confusing, but hopefully not. So it says, um, a certain tradition of Cuban censorship, or at least Cuban censorship in literature, during the last 15 years has already been documented, and this has been studied a lot. As early as 1961, the banning of a short documentary called PM, directed by Sabá Cabrera Infante and Orlando Jiménez Leal, initiated uh, an old paradox that was originally in culture in the 20th century. And this is the paradox. If the, if the avant-garde became the party and the leader, what would be the place for the transgression of the new artistic, uh, artistic sphere? Or to put it in another way, how can we think the relationship between the social elites and the cultural production in the, social, in the context of a socialist society? This censorship of a 12-minute documentary led up to the famous uh, meeting with Fidel Castro in the National Library, which is called uh, Palabras a los Intelectuales, so words to the intellectuals. A reunion that, in the words of Antonio José Ponte, a very important Cuban writer, called a reunión de miedo, or reunion of fear, meeting of fear. Focus on the carnivalistic atmosphere of Castro's speech and the infamous intervention by Marxist cultural ministers, such as Garcia Buchaca and Carlos Rafael Rodriguez, has often overshadowed an important effect of that meeting, which is that there, for me, that initiated a new and unprecedented mode of speech, perhaps what Professor Avellaneda has called in the Argentinian context el habla de la ideología, a new mode of speech in the intellectual scene was developed there, or in the cultural front. That exchange between power and literature established a new tradition of intellectual freedom, which perhaps the most famous case is Virgilio Piñera, which maybe some of you have read before. This scenario suggests that any formation of a high authoritarian state designates art as a tool for political control. This political climate, in fact, fostered a new apparatus of domination in which the work of writers, filmmakers, poets, had the same value as, let's say, the productive uh, real productive forces of that society. And then later on, when we moved to Quinquenio, Greece, which was a five-year uh, period where culture was dominated by uh, the Ministry of Interior and the state, exemplified, I think, the way in which the elite and culture <coughs> prior to that period were able to construct the consensus for the state. And here I have some examples, for instance. Lesama Lima wrote very... Um, encomiastic and important text on the movement of July 26. Uh, something that is not very well known, uh, Guillermo Cabrera Infante, which is understood sometimes as a very anti-Castro writer, wrote in favor of fusilamientos, no? of uh, revolutionary justice. Or even Tomás Gutiérrez Alea, as you know, the director of Guantanamera and Memories of Underdevelopment, wrote in favor of PM, the documentary, uh, in a very uh, important essay where he, if, uh, um, he was in favor of censorship and gave it theoretical grounding called Free Cinema and Objectivity. That's from 61. But this is the argument, and this is where Néstor Díaz de Villegas fits in. Along or besides this narrative of a state, we should read another parallel narrative in light of this intimate correspondence between culture and texture in the making of a new cultural hegemony. Mainly a tradition that following James Scott one could call that of hidden transcripts, which neither accepts the uh, domain of the state nor speaks in the place of a dominant discourse. So those are people who are outside of this, you know, uh, this apparatus of the state. For Scott, a, to elaborate a theory of the voice under domination, that's what he calls it, means precisely to examine the ways in which ideological resistance is disguised, muted, and veiled for the safety's sake. It is in this unique poetic event where one should, I think, uh, place Nestor Diaz de Villegas and his importance, his critical importance in the Cuban literary tradition. In fact, I would argue, and this is a very brief, I guess, a sketch for a more ambitious project, hopefully, I would, that I could undertake later on, 
um, that is impossible to conceive or even imagine this tradition of hitting scripts, people who resisted this uh, vision of the state without the way in which he interpolated the new cultural scene in Cuba in the 19, especially in 1973. And this is an anecdote that I want to tell. In 1973, at the age of 18, Nestor Díaz de Villegas wrote a poem called Oda Carlos III, O to Charles III, which alluded to Havana's famous avenue that by order of Fidel Castro, after the Chilean coup, was renamed Salvador Allende. Nestor Díaz de Villegas published this, this poem in a uh, single and uh, almost handmade uh, sheet of paper, and he circulated among friends. Because of this, and because some of his friends told the Ministry of Interior he was accused of a very mysterious category that I'm in, interested in studying, which is ideological diversionism, and he was sentenced to six years in prison. So this is very important, you know, because uh, the, the, the theoretical conclusion is that here we see that the state, he did nothing really serious. He, there is no um, offense really in that point, but just a fact of parody, you know, and this is an element that I, I want to explore because it seems that the state, the communist state, cannot tolerate parody, you know, and parody, as we know, is some a philosopher says that it's one of the most uh, serious genres in literature. But this anecdote, anecdote marks not only the beginning of Diaz de Villegas' enactment of resistance, but also the rupture of a condition, and this is the name of the event, of a post-revolutionary post condition for culture, for two reasons. One, because as we say, a revolution that is not able to tolerate parody is no longer revolution. It's almost as if parody can, can reveal the, 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 the tra traumatic uh, aspect of, of, the, of the revolution. And second, because the point, this is the point where the state becomes violent, right? Instead of going against its real um, origin, which was to end up, let's say, injustice and a real more ground violence. So the state itself becomes a new way of violence, which is symbolized maybe by, well, ultimately by this idea of creating a new man, well, the social engineer of Guevara, which is, it should be questioned. Uh, the radicality of Nacho Díaz Villegas acts then is clear. His poetic acts, his poetic act undercuts fear and censorship, therefore meshing the presence of his, of his uh, enunciation, I think, with his uh, language. More than 20 years later, recalling this event, particularly in his life and in his, uh, in, in his poetic beginnings, because he was very young, he was only 18, he writes in Héroes, a poem that I want to read in Spanish and then translate the last, uh, the last, the last uh, stanza. It's, this is así. La oda a Carlos III estuvo completa en las primeras semanas de septiembre. Le hablaba al monarca de los nuevos héroes que habían usurpado su casa en la avenida Salvador Allende. La lluvia ha borrado sus ojos, sus labios, sus oídos, pero él lo entiende, aunque no pueda ver o oír decir. This is a quote from that point. And then he finishes like this. Me tomé la palabra. Cuando faltan lenguas, siempre quedan algunas que hablan por todas. En el silencio más profundo resuena la verdad como una algarabía. And I'll finish with this. I think one should stress the importance of this last stanza, which, did any of my students understand a little bit of that? Okay, I'll translate it. Yeah. <laughs> I took the word, this is the last stanza, Andrew. I took the word, when there were languages lacking, there was, there, was only, there was always one that speaks for all. The most powerful silence resonates in sheer truth. I'm sorry if this is a bad translation. Good, very good translation. <laughs> <laughs> Here, David Villegas articulates the poetic discourse that he introduced, for, for my, my reading, in the literary tradition of Cuban Revolution at the same time that he closes any possibility of the heroic violence, or, sorry, the heroic voice of a totalizing project. In the same vein as Rodolfo Walsh, open letter to military junta, the hidden script, or the voice of resistance of Néstor Díaz de Villegas conveys not only <coughs> through what is said, but well, through what is lacking, against, that is against uh, an idea of silence. The poetic event then functions not to come uh, to terms with the past, but <clears throat> especially in this poem where he goes back to memory. It's not a, an idea of coming to terms with the past or any kind of nostalgia that we see in many poetic traditions of exile. Of, of course, that's important, but I think there is something else working here. 
But it's rather, and this is I think important, rather it's, he's able to, to put into question a certain tradition and question also the literary values of that tradition. In his latest book, uh, this is the final thing I would say, in, the fa in his latest book, Cuna del Pintor Desconocido, <clears throat> published at the, last, at the end of last year, could be read in many ways as a closure of Villegas' Ars Poetica, where resistance has now been displaced into also the a space of the exile, for instance, right? There are many critiques there of the experience that he had in Miami and in the United States, working in factories, etc. So it's almost like there is a dimension of social poetry here, too. So it is in this tradition that perhaps one day, along with the films of Nicolás Guillén Landrián or Guillermo Rosales in prose, one in film and another in prose, one could write a condensed secret history of resistance at the margins of the culture space, of the culture space in the Cuban Revolution. Uh, at present, in this preliminary cartography then, there is only the voice of Nestor Díaz de Villega, and we have him, we're glad to have him here. Um, yeah, yeah. Thank you very much, um, And thank you, University of Florida, for having me here. Uh, I'm a Floridian. I, I uh, spent most of my life in Miami. I came to Miami when I was 23, and I left when I was like 40 something. I went to Los Angeles, and now I come back to uh, you know the uh, landscapes that I know so well. You know, so um, and uh, thank you for waiting to. Y cómo se llama nuestro amigo? Roberto and Shane for yeah, driving me around and taking me to places and that is uh, uh, good weather for me, bad weather for you. Uh, so um, I, I'm also going to read a little bit, but uh, I don't like to, to be confined to you know the uh, text that I'm going to read. So um, if at any point you have uh, any inkling to ask anything, uh, just you know, go ahead and just talk to me. Or we'll talk, we'll talk instead of me just addressing you. And so, at any point, any of the points that I'm going to make, uh, it's uh, of any interest to you and it, it just uh, requires uh, dialogue, just, just, just do it. Thank you to the Department of Modern Languages, Spanish and Portuguese, also for having me here. Um, as you know, the, uh, the title of this uh, talk, <coughs> Poetry and Post Revolution, I added a little, uh, a little uh, more. The Return of the Badi Bard. I think Badi in English means Badi, it means like a cuckoo, like, kind of like crazy. Badi Bard, and uh, of course, excuse my English, this is my a quiet language, my second language, and I'm going to open the program and make a lot of mistakes. So, as you probably know or suspect, I arrived at the title of my talk by sheer chance, as a result of an unspoken agreement. After reading my latest book, this one, Cradle of the Unknown Artist, uh, Gerardo Muñoz, to whom I owe the honor to be addressing you this evening, found that the terms poetry and revolution followed necessarily from the premises of, of the text. I agreed, or pretended to agree, <laughs> and from that point on, the whole thing snowballed into a full-fledged exploration forced upon me in part by the time honor custom of giving names to talks and in part by the impromptu nature of such name-calling enterprises. So here I am stuck with a title so engrossing and all-encompassing that I feel already somewhat overwhelmed and utterly incapable of even beginning to cover its multiple ramifications and juxtapositions in just 25 minutes or so. Thank you very much, Gerard. <laughs> I certainly hope that I can meet your challenge. Let's start by the commanding first term of the equation, poetry. I must begin by saying that as I started writing poetry at a very young age. I must have been six when I produced my first real work. 
a description of one of my aunts. Very garrulous and purplish. I mean my prose, not my relation. <laughs> that early piece made the rounds of the after dinner gatherings at various family rooms and certified me instantly as a bona fide boy genius. You may laugh now. But that wicked piece of childish poetic prose contained, hidden in its excesses, the seed of real juicy things to come. Let's refer to that mysterious variable as a trick or a trait of the trait. I am referring, of course, to the unblinking, cold, and quite unforgiving stare of the artist. A slimy gaze that makes everyone in a room, especially a family room, uncomfortable and jittery. <laughs> Certainly, my poor aunt was very upset. Next, I'd like to bring to your attention this apparently unrelated tidbit. Let's call it a piece of trivia. The great British painter Francis Bacon worked only from photographs. He didn't dare face his sitters. Or, or subject them to the brutal onslaught of his, of his daggers, or rather his batting latches. As a matter of fact, a quote from an interview with Francis serves as an excerpt to my book. Asked about his method of portraiture, Bacon replied, I like to be alone, totally alone with their memories. That quote brings us to the second and in no way less ghastly term of the Munoz equation, revolution. I lived in the midst of one, not just anyone, but the real thing, the Coca-Cola of revolutions. As a Californian, I am inclined to say I survived the big one. Such catastrophic event took place around the time, let's call it that, of my portrait of, of an aunt. Everything around us crumbled in a matter of, it seemed to the younger me, or mini-me, nanoseconds. The aunt was gone, the family fled, the houses went bust, the faucets dried up. The pharmacy, the corner store, the storefronts were emptied and boarded up. This is the Cuba the tourists visit nowadays and photographers love, a culture judged by its ruins. The very fabric of time, or space-time, was torn asunder. Here is where memory that we introduced before, in the Baconian way, in the sense of horror of the present, appears. The other Francis Bacon, the grand great uncle of the former, once said something very clever. Antiquitas seculi juventus mundi, or antiquity, is the youth of the world. A reversal of fortunes, that is. And so it was for us. The past became youthful and whole, full of aunts and families and cars and bosses and pretty stores, while the present, the actual, withered. For us, a great chunk of reality became just antiquity, just vacant. I would, I would have to rely forever, relay forever on memory, base all my queries on the moldy photographs of the time lost. This is why we, children of the revolution, don't place too much talk in those catchphrases that other people hold so dear. We were busy trying to survive a major hurricane, and the word free in such circumstances is misleading and meaningless, because not only uh, because the only thing free for a revolutionary childhood is rather the free fall of reality that a moment ago seemed unshakable. Fortunately, this is something of which only the happy few have a first knowledge, uh, first hand knowledge. Revela revolutions, occur, uh, uh, revolutions occur from time to time. The very word means cycle something that relapses. We have the French Revolution and the Russian Revolution and then the Cuban Revolution. Those are the revolutions that I'm acquainted with. 
not to be confused with the information revolution, which is something rather humane and bonding. My revolution, the one I lived and survived, is the, revol the revolt of the uninformed, a communication breakdown. Because there is no medium, no carrier of information, nor a metaphysical connection that could make someone naive become acquainted with revolution or with the revolutionary experience. Once the revolution is done, it's gone. Wham, bam, thank you, ma'am. You would need the total energies of a whole nation to reproduce it, but then again, you would lose the nation itself in the process. There's a great divide that separates those who did live the revolution and those who didn't. Let's call it the navel divide, after the great neurobiologist, neurobiologist Thomas Nagel, whose 1985 paper, What is a Bat?, proved that no matter how well you get to know every aspect of the physiology, biology, neurology of a bat, you will never understand intrinsically what is to be a bat. Same with the revolution. Dream it, think it, will it, you'll never live it. It will never be part of your heart and soul, of your ticks and nightmares. So ladies and gentlemen, think of me as an endangered species. <laughs> the revolutionary batty bard, if you will. Now don't forget that the revolution was imposed upon us by our, our fathers, who conceived it, wished it, managed it, and brought it to fruition. And remember that they were able to accomplish it, accomplish all of it, in record time, 1953, 1958. I was born in 1956, <coughs> right in the midst of it. Because they were great entrepreneurs, great salesmen, a nation of willy-nilly Romans. They sold the idea of revolution to themselves, then to the world, and then even to you. But a ground level revolution is like any other political phenomenon, just a matter of commerce, of commercials, of propaganda and demagoguery. This is why we talk of exporting the revolution, because its creators were profiteers, traders, and merchants of, merchants of ideals, very, and very good at what they did. Let's also say that eventually I grew up, left the small town uh, for the capital, city, the capital city of Havana, there, in the medieval quarter, or the old Havana, not far from the vacant capital where our House of Representatives used to convene, I met a young writer who gave me the first important books, provided me with the first serious concepts of poetry. Under his influence, my writing evolved into a more or less, uh, into more or less its present, present form. His name was Pedro Jesus Campos. I, I brought pictures of him, but uh, it, my computer is not working with the, the system. Uh, but his name was Pedro Jesus Campos. He died of AIDS at the Miami Municipal Hospital in 1992 at the age of 38, and is buried in an unmarked grave. Twenty years before his death, Pedro and I had been confronted with our political, with our first political crisis. We were expelled from the National Academy of the Arts. Just because of the length of our hair, just because of our air, our way of being, or because of uh, the manner in which the revolution looked at us. At that moment, that was revolution for us, a far cry from the romantic ideals of our elders. A very different affair from what is generally understood by, the na by that name in the North American campus <coughs> environment. As a, result of, as a result of such revolutionary events as prohibition, expulsion, censorship, and militarization of private life, and I began to write, quite naturally, political poetry. Three years after being kicked out of art school, I wrote my first post-revolutionary poem. I didn't know this. Gerardo Muñoz made me understand it. Uh, he made me see post-revolution for what it is. The title of the poem, Ode 
to Charles III, which is the name of the, uh, the title of the uh, Spanish monarch from the 18th century, and also the name of the main thoroughfare in Havana. In 1973, the name of the boulevard was changed into that of the slain uh, president of Chile, Salvador Allende. I wrote a poem praising the king and lamenting his being deposed. I had receded into the warped limits of antiquity in search of a time before time, before the big bang of revolution. A year after this event, my poem fell in the hands of the political police. Uh, I was tried and sentenced to six years of pri pri privation of freedom or, uh, on the grounds of ideological deviations and sent to a maximum security prison in Arisa, the central region of Cuba. <clears throat> End of the story. I was then 18 years old. <clears throat> I hope that I have been able to give you an approximate idea of how poetry and revolution cross paths and what becomes of a poet who happens to find himself in the crosshairs of history. For the poet, that eternal daredevil, it means revelation. The power of poetry presents itself in the most dramatic fashion and he feels empowered and e even when confined to a cell. The revolution operates here at an, end, at an end, at, uh, operates here at an individual scale. The one party rule, the one party rule, the central committee, and even the good intentions and all the sanctimonious platitudes break down. Revolution and all its atrocious energy becomes a very singular force. You feel compelled to then to go against the direction of history, or to be more precise, to go against the machine, the so-called apparatus, the party. Yes, indeed, against revolution. Oh my God, what I said, have I just said, to go against revolution? Like Superman carrying Lois Lane in his arms and flying <laughs> clockwise clock, clock around the earth? Is it possible? Imagine that. By the power conferred to me, the poet, to conceive a world that brings us back to square one. Because in truth, uh, we, what we Cubans hope for, the imperfect democracy that Cubans envision in their imperfect future, had been there all along. What is hard to swallow is the notion, almost a quantum notion, that our future lays in our past. That our antiquity is the youthful age of our culture. Someday the Republic and its institutions will return and will be greeted by her much older twin sister, the Revolution, that remained behind. And this is exactly the meaning of post-revolution. The efforts of human economists, historians, sociologists, and political thinkers, and all the young uh, 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 thinkers of today, of the last decade, have been devoted almost exclusively to that period called the Republic, where aliens lived, an uncharted territory, territory in our own backyard that remained banned and condemned is, one, is the one place that nevertheless holds the answers to our big questions. For the explorer of the unknown, for those who dare go where no man has gone before, post-revolution means pre-revolution. That, I trust, takes care of the political part of the problem. Now, concerning poetry, it's more an, an open uh, subject, so we can talk about it. If you have experience with it, then we can exchange uh, notes. I'd like to remind you that poetry Uh, that the poetry we were exposed at the time of the revolutionary events mentioned above was colloquial poetry, so-called colloquial poetry. Poetry based on the uh, plain speech and the common speech of everyday uh, 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 parlance. A lyricism that was supposed to address the common people. And I'd like to stress that colloquialism and commonality was precisely what my friend, the late Pedro Jesus Campos and I were trying to avoid at all costs. In the Cuban of the so-called Quinquenio Greece, 
or grain, grain five years, which is a, a, a a moment in, in, in human history, which is more or less from 1972 to 1977, I went to jail in 1973, in which uh, the Second Congress of, 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 of Culture uh, uh, gave the nation the guidelines for uh, you know, the, the politics in, 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 in culture. So during that, at that very moment, we were 15, 16, we were very young, 17, and we invented intuitively what, it, what in the outside world was known as minimalism. On, on, on this hand, we have colloquialism. So we have the poets. Some of these poets are dead. Some, of, some, of, some others are now in exile. One of the great poets of colloquialism in exile, a poet that even wrote great odes against homosexuals, is Raúl Rivero. He is in Spain now, and now he's dissident. So you know, people change. But at that moment, some of, some of his books contained uh, uh, several poems, uh, you know, talking about this ah, ah, ah this strange ah, ah, maricone, ah, ah. Mm -hmm. so we kind of making fun of, of maricone. So, and these were poems based on the popular sentiments, you know, the, of of, a, of this culture. So we were doing, trying to do something to completely different. So we were different. So we went for the minimum. The very small. So uh, we didn't know that this was called outside minimalism. We just knew intuitively that this is what could change the big chunks of uh, socialist uh, uh, poetry. Our poems from that period never dare go beyond five or six lines, in contrast to the long tirades of our colloquial counterpart counterparts. Those brief poems were programmatically romantic and steeped in modernness, in meaning the modernist, the modernistas, Darío, you know, those writers from you know, uh, Nicaragua, uh, Colombia, and Cuba that created this, this new mode, this new feeling in poetry uh, in, the, in the early 1900s, late, uh, um, late 1900s, early 20th century. Uh, we had adopted the playful paradigms of Rubén Darío, and the melanch melancholic diction of Los Heraldos Negros, which is a great book, a wonderful book by a Peruvian poet, Cesar Vallejo, that we read widely in, in the Cuba of the 1970s. <coughs> the rhyme became an important element of our work. In other words, we created the postmodern, lacking contacts with contemporary sources, we had chanced into the major forces, the major uh, uh, current of uh, Western uh, art. So I want to finish with that. This is the moment in which we arrive at the, the uh, uh, poetic language that we um, use through our, throughout our lives. Pedro's life was very short, was quite short. He was my, my uh, mentor. And I continue to, to write and to write books always in the uh, and the vein of those years that were the formative year, years for me. Uh, if you have any questions, just please go ahead. Um, did you still write poetry while you were in prison? I did. As a matter of fact, I did. And I have some of it that I have never published, but that I consider, uh, uh, you know, some of the things that I want to uh, keep, that I want to keep. Yes. Uh, I would like to suggest something before we jump to questions. Do you want to read and tell us a little bit more about this oh, book? This book, uh, uh, this book, and perhaps read some a uh, few poems, and yes, then we can take some more questions, and you can read maybe some other. Yeah. Well, that, this uh, will give you an idea of, of, of what I do. Don't <laughs> uh, What I do, um, I write in Spanish. I write in Spanish mostly, but then after so many years in in America. In, uh, or in the United States of America, it is another America. Uh, uh, I uh, started writing just by you know by chance in English, you know. So you know it's very funny because Nabokov, Vladimir Nabokov, the great uh, Russian uh, writer, uh, he was a great writer in English. If you read Lolita, Lolita, was especially Pale Fire, one of the great novels. You'll see that you know this is the ultimate English 
experience, you know, you really enjoy this, this is amazing uh, uh, master of the language. But when he, I, I saw him on television on YouTube and, uh, you know, his classes were very, very, very famous. But he, he had a, big, a, a great Russian accent. He was like, blah, blah, blah. but he was a master. So I said, why not? <laughs> because, uh, you know, this is my language too, you know, I, 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 I talk in the supermarket everywhere. So I called them tinfoil sites, my, my little uh, section of the book in English. So I'm going to read a couple of, of them, and I, 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 didn't, uh, um, I didn't rehearse this, so you know, I'm going to probably pronounce a few words uh, wrong. <laughs> so, but, you know, this is the English we talk nowadays, and the country has become a bilingual country. It's a, uh, it's a country where Spanish has become like, like the second language. It's a little resistance or a big resistance to, to acknowledge that, but that, that's the way it is. So the, uh, the fact is that I'm here because there's a literature being written in Spanish in this country. So it is like, you know, the, the uh, literature being written in Hebrew in Alexandria in the second century. Or, you know, may, it, this has happened many, many times, you know, in history. So it happened in America. America should take, America or United States of America, should to, to take care uh, of this literature, should uh, uh, cherish it. It's not even being published or acknowledged or, you know, we have to go to Spain to publish. So, you know, this is something that I, I hope changes. But the, uh, the uh, close proximity of the whole continent, you know, starts the, uh, south of the, uh, se llama, Rio, Bra Bravo. The, the Bravo uh, the river, where I go, I live in Los Angeles, I drive two miles and I'm in Tijuana. So I go to Tijuana to go to Gandhi um, bookstore, and then you, you, you cross the border. Uh, actually, this is like literally, you cross the border and you walk like, like this, and then you're in this most fabulous bookstore with everything, everything like the latest literature in the, in the whole universe. And I go to Tijuana, and then I come back and they say, you went to Tijuana? I say, yes. I say, well, how come? Are you crazy? Mm. You know, I go to Tijuana to get good books. <laughs> they don't believe me. So, but it's right there. So why don't we, we don't have anything like that, just, you know, across the border on the other side. Gandhi, great library. That gay bookstore. So, uh, you know, those are the um, idiosyncrasies of our uh, hybrid culture. So this is the way, the world in, the, in, where, uh, in which we, at least I live, I live. So we'll talk about it later. So, but this is, uh, don't let the words get in. And uh, you, please, English masters or, or English public speaking people, tell me what you think. <laughs> don't let the words get in the middle. They will impose the reign of terror. They are the cause, they are the cause, the effect, the pharaoh, the sum total of every fear. Because their troops of fallen angels can see the future before it happens. No one can fold a single wing without them knowing of the flopping. Beware the sudden blow of error. A slash, a serif, becomes bent sinister. Their tom tom blood, their top top sperm, don't let them leave, they'll leave and learn. Oh, you the poet of Alhambra, I live in Alhambra. <laughs> oh, you the poet of Alhambra, tempted, tempted to sail some niggling strophe. They'll, mar they'll mark your head, they'll strip you bare, you'll never know what hit you square. Knowing the music of their functioning won't make you clever in the science of the interruptions of the silence, ventriloquist swallowing mountains. No bad. So say it. I'm gonna read another one. Uh, yeah, you, you wanted to to read the. Uh, oh no. Oh, this is going pure. I wanted me to read this one. Ah, by the way, at the same time that this is happening, this is great. You know, in Havana, there is a meeting of writers. And they are writing and reading my poems at the same time. I read the poems to a machine, to a, a computer, send them over by an MP3 uh, file, and at this very moment, listening. they're listening to the same poems. Preach. 
So, yeah. So we wanted to have them, but it, it was impossible to have a Skype uh, connection or a telephone connection. It wasn't, like, we couldn't do it. But this is happening by, you know, by, co uh, by coastal, no, by, uh, by nation, by nation. By, by nation. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is called Dream. I woke up in the last morning of the world, feeling myself and the world, pinching the word, reciting a prayer over the fire cold, spitting in the flaccid lake. Great circles gripped me ashore, following the steps, steps of some unannounced visitor on the waters, the rippling of his voice, like the ebbing of his robe, barely traced with dust of solid, of lucid soul. Death is my only reality, I said to myself, avoiding screen tests and falsehoods, and yes, unavoidable. Burning giraffes became symbols of the death of unimaginative powers. Towers in flames were reminders of the fallacies that someone had left behind like a carcass. But nothing had fallen before, retrospectives, retrospectives or films or a stele of death, a succession of balancing acts, nothing had ever sunk to the level of gas. So I turned and I tossed and I tossed and I turned trying to close my eyes. They got shot from outside. Mm. I didn't impress you. <laughs> um, uh, this one is a long poem. Um, oh well, you know I write. Uh, I'm gonna re read one more. Uh, I write also um, uh, uh, sonnets in English. Sonnets. So I I, uh, I wrote a couple of sonnets to um, to uh, to a friend that was visiting from Cuba. And she, she, we, were in, we were in downtown Miami for a little while, and uh, she, uh, for the first time, you know, she would pass by one of these um, uh, machines that have this, like, uh, Zoltan, the, the, the great guy with the turban that tells you your, your future. We put a dollar machine. I don't know how they call that. You know what, you know what I'm talking about? Yeah. 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 A fortune teller, you know, like a, me a mechanic fortune teller. So she said, oh, my God. And then that, that uh, um, uh, 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 character started moving like a very human-like form, and uh, she she was the first for her, and she was very impressed. And I saw her, you know, being like very childish and, and, and happy, and I wrote a poem for her. Her name is Gisela. Um, and then uh, a, a, the, the poem is called. Uh, I'm gonna try to read it correctly. It's many, many words that I, I don't know how to pronounce exactly. But uh, the the poem is called um, Talking Head. And uh, these are sonnets, there are three sonnets for Gisela. And, and uh, the uh, dedication is for Gisela, Sphinx for a day. They say yes, Sphinx, no? Sphinx? Like Sphinx? Sphinx. Sphinx. No? Sphinx. What is a robot doing in the mall, in a glass cage, his skin transparent and clear, as plastic and yet, and yet so real, and Selmus speaking? answering my call. A hypercube now houses the solution to every question. Theory of all is very sentence clumsily foretold. My lack of faith and also my delusion. He moves, up, he moves about in crabby mambo, hero of yesterday's symbols turned tomorrow. Absconded with this lesser toy, my sorrow becomes a cipher, then, then becomes a zero. How dare you hide your secrets, talking head? You must reveal the wisdom of the dead. And Zelmo spoke, my friend, you are quite dead. For all I care, you aren't even real. You, you need a shower, guy, you need a meal. Go find a woman or a god instead. You've been twice through this fine ordeal. You'll find yourself in anybody's bed. Desire is golden, but your mind is lead. Rip off your, rip off your clothes of, uh, rip off your clothes of flesh. The seventh seal. 
For every answer brings a volunteer, and every word declines in every question. It's five o'clock. I'm craving for digestion of all the little souls that caught my ear. I'm utterly, mecha I'm utterly mecha mechanic. What do you expect? Come, come, and show me some respect. Everything's happening at the same time, but all I got to lose is just a dime on a machine transported to remote futures where I shall, shall no longer vote for flesh or clay right here or over there, for everything takes place in a nightmare. Immersed in abundance of space, like clammy undifferentiated on soup, undifferentiated soup, coming from every corner, a single coop disintegrates my faith at every turn. My shadow rests assured, ready to burn, in the blue sky and leaves without a trace. I promise ten dimensions, come with me, a well hung universe for a fee. <laughs> That's the fun part. Poetry is fun. Politics is not. So I'm really not a politician. I talk about politics because politics messed, messed, ¿cómo se dice? Pasado de mess? Mess me. Uh, mess me. Uh, but I, I, I don't have anything to do with politics. I have to do with words put together in a certain way. So, okay. so, uh, so this is what I like really, and uh, uh, this is what I dedicate my life to uh, uh, poetry. But uh, I'm going to read one. Uh, let me see. I want to read a couple. I have to read a couple. I'm not going to understand but, uh, completely, but if, if you don't, please stop me and I will... will, will uh, okay. Uh, th these poems are, are poems to exile. I came from, from Cuba at 23 years old with a, an 18-year-old wife. So uh, at the beginning we went, I want to tell you this too, so you understand the, the, uh, the, uh, the feel of the poems. So we went to California, we went to Los Angeles, where I am now, uh, where I'm at now, but uh, that didn't last. Uh, we, we couldn't uh, make it in California, so we came to Florida. But while being there, immediately, my family didn't know anything, so they said, oh, great, you're here. We have, we have a job for you. And the next, the following day, I was like in a uh, uh, factory of uh, furniture, like carrying these like, huge frames of furniture. <laughs> You know, I didn't know any of that. I was an artist. I was a, a, a writer, a poet that came out of jail, five years of jail, to that. So instead of telling me, like I tell people now I come from Cuba or from anywhere, I said, you know, and, and you know, my, my neighbors are from, from Iran, and I tell them, look, go to school, go to school, you know. So instead of telling me, no, 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 you are going to go to college, my, my, my dear, my dear uh, uh, friend. No, 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 you're going to go to work. So I went to work. So, you know, my experience with work is horrible. You know, I don't like to work like that. I like to work. I'm I, a hard worker, but not in a, in a factory. So, my days in the factory are haunted me forever. <laughs> yes. And I worked very hard for many years. You know, I worked in, in there and many other places until, you know, I finally understood the system and I said, the hell with this. I need something else. <laughs> but uh, this is uh, the poem. To those days, I'm gonna read very slow. The title is Los Dos Primeros Años Aquí Son Los Más Duros. The two first years here, I'm gonna translate, I don't, I don't care, I'll translate it a little bit. The, those, those, uh, the two first, year, uh, first years here are the hardest. Mi joven esposa sentada sobre el bastidor, desarreglada y pereñada, habla por el teléfono. Que yo era un traidor lo concedía, abandoné mi patria y me llevé a la más bella de sus hijas. Luego, en el gran apartamento, la vida me aburría. Singábamos en el baño de pie contra los cisnes de azulejo, envueltos en buquet de cachemira y palmo oliva. O en la cocina, Borras de café en los pies y cocaína en las venas en todas partes o al revés detrás de las cortinas, viendo pasar el mundo por la esquina. 
Había espejos por toda la casa, había muebles viejos, regalo de las primas. Los colores no coincidían con las flores de papel y la mesa tenía carcomidas las patas de madera. Había niños jugando afuera. Que yo era un traidor no lo he negado, abandoné mi patria cuando más dolía. Después en ninguna patria me he quedado, la imagen del traidor me, pe me perseguía, huyendo de la secreta policía, me perdí en un mundo congelado, yo no sé si he perdido o he ganado. Ahora esto se llama factorías, factories. Deambulábamos de factoría en factoría, no había ni un momento para el arte, llenos de inquietud sobrevivimos, acomodados, por no decir aniquilados, comíamos y bebíamos. La Merro te cosió los dedos y los patos. La Merro es una máquina donde uno trabaja en la factoría, que son las viejas cubanas que cosen, hacen y hacen una bulla horrible y te cogen un dedo y te lo traspasan. Y eso, esas máquinas para mí significaban el horror. La, la, la Merro te cosió los dedos y los párpados con hilo negro con suetudinario. El corazón te pegaba con stitches. Debajo de reflectores padecías. En el baño fumabas a escondidas. Virgen creada a mi semejanza. La For Lady era una vieja desdentada. La escupimos en plena cara los dos juntos. ¿Lo recuerdas? Abrimos la puerta y dimos un portazo de hierros corrugados que sonó por todo el exilio de porquería. Eso era lo que la gente no veía, lo que no comprendía la familia. Esos que nunca, nunca, pero nunca quitaron los forros de nylon transparente a los juegos de sala decadentes y un rococó estilo Hialeah. <risa> Este se llama 4 de julio. Este es mi, eh, bueno, eh, digamos, this day, this was my first 4 of July in America. Estamos solos un día soleado. La carretera pasa por la ventana. El televisor que habíamos soñado es una pesadilla multicolor. Las banderas ondean en la casa. Nadie puede devolvernos el sueño, lo que se perdió. Lo que nos quitaron se agita en la mala memoria. No decimos palabra el uno al otro. Comida en la mesa, tranquilidad en la sopa y en los pagos. Este es un día, un día señalado. No hay gente describiendo lo que ve. Hay gente mirando a la repisa donde es día feriado. Descansa el aparato que habíamos soñado, dando irreparables, alegres noticias. Hay paz en el orbe, suben risas desde la calle, olor a pólvora, ruidos, chillidos, alarmas de carro, ecos, alaridos, todos hemos triunfado. La poesía siempre, my poetry is always dramatic and, and performatic. So, uh, no sé si quieres leer uno más corto para después tomar algunas preguntas. Yeah, leo uno más corto, ok. Sí, el último, sí. No, no, no. Ok, entonces les voy a leer, les voy a leer eh, un soneto. Yo escribo soneto, muchos sonetos en español, en inglés también, como vieron, eh, me sé las medidas exactas de cómo se escribe soneto en español. Eh, I write sonnets in English and Spanish. Uh, English, I, I, I went to a master, Shakespeare, and I, and I uh, studied his, his wonderful uh, sonnets. And uh, then in Spanish, of course, we have like, you know, the masters of, of sonnets, Quevedo, Lope, etc. And we have like uh, wonderful uh, sonnets, masterpieces in Spanish. So, you know, to, to, to uh, uh, deal with that is just uh, overwhelming. But uh, you know, I write about uh, sonnets about work of works of art. So in esta in este soneto en español, yo veo a Francis Bacon, que es el gran el pintor uh, británico que murió hace poco, que era un borracho y un loco. Francis Bacon, no, you know, I had all the pictures. Uh, you know Francis Bacon, the great British painter. If you don't know him, just go right now after this talk and uh, go online and go look for Francis Bacon or in your uh, uh, Italian poems. 
So, <laughs> so Francis was a great painter, and uh, like, like I said in my talk, Francis was afraid. That, what was it? Don't worry, the name of Yeah, Francis in, in his uh, in his. Um, one of his uh, interviews, he's a great talker, he's a great interviewer, interviewee. Uh, he, he, he explained to the interviewer, he said, no, 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 I take a picture of my subject, of my sitter, and then I take it to my, my uh, studio, and then I work from that picture. Because if I, if I subject that person to my, my stare, you know, I kick, you know, it's horrible, horrible. It's like the, 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 the Gorgona, or whatever you call it, you know, it's bad, it's bad, bad, bad eye, evil eye. So, Francis Bacon, in the same interview, said, but then painting is, died, painting died with the Pope Leo X by Velasquez. Velasquez painted, Velasquez went to Italy when, in, in, in his first, first trip to Italy, the second trip uh, took place uh, 10 years after. But in his first trip to Italy, he met uh, Leo X at the Vatican. And of course, he being you know famous for portraiture, Leo seated for him. And this is the end of painting, according to Francis Bacon. This is the end of representation. There's nothing you can do after that. It's so incredible. Years after, I had the pleasure of going to Rome and going to the um, the place where the uh, the painting is. I stood before it. But Francis Bacon stood before it the years before, and he was like he went just like, oh, what the. Uh, so that was a revelation for him. So I picture him in front of this of this uh, painting, and this is the sonnet: Francis Bacon delante del Papa Inocencio X de Velázquez. Y es un soneto. Este guerrero puesto de rodillas delante de la puerca de la historia, pidiendo absolución de su memoria a aquel que obró primeras maravillas. Reconoce la técnica irrisoria en minúsculas ruedas de alforcilla, empapada la silla de Castilla, nada menos que el manto de la gloria. La pintada visión por todas partes resuma realidad y sin embargo es la más traicionera de las artes. ¿Cómo pintar la duda por encargo, la mirada que al público repartes, si el precio de mirar es tan amargo? Muchas gracias, querido. Now we have a few minutes, uh, maybe 10 or 15 minutes, to, to take some questions on whatever you like about the very lucid and polemic, I think, in, in introduction that <laughs> we had from Nestor. And, uh, so, or any questions about his books, uh, poetry, or anything you like? Yeah. Your poetry has a very musical quality to it. Oh, it's thank very you. Musical. Thank you very much. Yeah, I try. This is one of my main concern, the music habit. Um, you wrote a um, political poem that was controversial that got you into, into jail. Yes. Did you ever regret writing that poem, or was uh, do you ever look back and be like, oh, I shouldn't have done that, or? No, never. Never. No. No, it was my life. Uh, my life. Were there a lot of people that were in prison for the same thing? When you were in? No, not personally, the same thing. But uh, a, 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 something happened a year, exactly a year before at my school, the school where I was, you know, I was say, taken away from the, uh, the chair, you know, from So uh, something happened at school a year before. A professor of mathematics and a professor of, I don't remember what, what else, English or whatever, they were disappeared. So, you know, everybody, of course, you know, in, in, the, in the campus, everybody was like saying, Oh, what happened to Professor Rosa? Uh, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know. You know, no, so nobody knew. So a year after, I went to jail, I went to this, uh, you know, the uh, interrogation cells, and I spent like 30 days, like, no, 30 days in the interrogation cells, and then I, I went to a little bivac, it's a bivac, 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 a little, you know, a little uh, holding place, and finally they say, yes, I, we, we, we give you six years. So I went to the uh, jail, uh, prison proper. So when I got there, who do I find? Two professors. <laughs> <laughs> As a good American, have you, have you fought what you believe in life? Do I what? The reason you wrote the poem, 
than you, whatever it was. And then when you came to America, did you ever think about like fighting that, which you, what happened to you, which was injustice, basically? And, like, did you ever do something when you came to America to, to no. fight that or, or make yourself feel like... No, because, you know, I, I, I look inside myself and I reflect, and I, I'm not a political person. I, I, I write political poetry because you, you cannot be uh, indifferent. But uh, I'm not a political, so I don't belong to any parties. I vote, but I don't belong to this party or that party. Uh, I have my, my own uh, political opinion, uh, but it's, these are private, you know. Uh, so I, I fought in Cuba to have private opinions. That's my only fight. Private or private life. Meaning, I think that the change of the name of that avenue is it's, uh, crap. So I could say it without spending five years in Yale. So that's my only fight. No, I'm saying, did you continue? Or you no, 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 no. Yeah. I would live my private life in a factory, in my, my son, in my... I, I don't I don't need a political life. I, if you ask me that he did revolution and poetry, then I, I of course I give you my my take on that. But normally I don't I I don't do any any poetry. No. no. I don't know Spanish. <laughs> I don't even know English very well, but I can tell you write very well in English. No. And I'm assuming um, what language do you prefer, or what are the pros and cons of each language? Well, uh, you know, I have to make an effort at this point in both languages, because, of course, with, with erosion from English and Spanish becomes, you know, harder and harder, you know, I have to think about, if now I have apps in, in everywhere, my computer, my, my telephone, everywhere, because I go, oh yes, because uh, uh, I have to look the word, just to look it up. So in both languages, so, you know, this is my condition, I have to accept it, you know, I, I live in that, this by um, amphibious or whatever, life. So, but, you know, I, you know, I have to fight it when I write in Spanish and also when I write in English, you know, it's uh, like that, it's like a, um, you know, I live in, of course, in an in old in English environment, but that's not my first language, mm -hmm. so I have to, uh, go from one to the other. What language do you think? Uh, depending, both. You know, sometimes I'm writing in English and I could, you know, or translating, I translate it a lot, so I go from one to the, from one to the other. But no, my, my mo mother tongue, my language is Spanish. This is the one that, that comes, I dream in Spanish, or I, I uh, count in Spanish. Um, you said they were sent to six years, they spent five. What happened to that last year? Uh, the last year, this is, last year was 1979. It was like March 1979. At that moment, um, many uh, university professors and uh, intellectuals from the United States came, went to Cuba, and tried to initiate a dialogue with the... Uh,